All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Martha Alter Hines, and welcome. We have a big treat, which I know a lot of people have been waiting for. I'm here today with Kayoni Hanalei. And um, many of you watching probably already are familiar with Kayoni from Kayoni's work in general, but also conversations with Heather Ensworth. And um, we're about to have, I think, a pretty epic conversation <laughs> from what I can, or from what I'm feeling and from the conversation we've already been having. Um, Kayoni, thank you so much for the honor of being here and engaging with me and with us. And thank you. Oh, it's my honor. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm so happy to have this conversation and just see what wants to come through. And I also just want to share with you, Martha, that uh, your work has also inspired me. And so thank you so much for showing up in the way that you show up and for the way that you transfer your medicine. It's greatly appreciated. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And just so, so I think that our conversation is going to evolve in ways that we can't probably predict, but just to give people the taste of the, our intention for the topic is we're going to be um, talking about the Oort cloud beings and the Kuiper belt beings in particular ones with that you're feeling particularly drawn to Kaoni, right? And, and then I think we're going to be weaving in again, I don't think we can fully predict what, but I think I think some themes relating to Mu, to Lemuria, to love, what love is, um, our hearts. Uh, I, I I don't even know yet. <laughs> so, yes, so whatever is meant to come through is going to be coming through. Um, but should we start with dropping in? You have something specific that you want to invite us into? Yeah, thank you, Martha. Okay. You know, speaking of Mu which is a culture that, you know, I've been like born into, like, as far as like my genetics, but also like spiritually born into this culture of Mew, which is prehistoric ancient Hawaiian culture. Some people may refer to it as Lemuria, um, but we have a tradition in Mew. It's called Kulike. Uh, and Kulike is the ancient Mew greeting. If we were to greet one another, uh, this is what we would do. This is how we would behave. So first, kulike means to stand tall. And it's referring energetically that we meet one another in our integrity. And this is why, you know, before we go into a conversation, before we engage with one another, we ensure that we show up in integrity, but we're also uh, celebrating and uh, honoring the integrity of the other person so that as we engage, we meet one another in equal measure. Um, so kulike, and I'll just kind of uh, share with you the logistics of it so that we can truly drop into the feeling of it. In kulike, we honor the feminine and the masculine, internal feminine and masculine. The internal masculine is located in the throne of the heart, we call the pu'uvai. And so that internal masculine, uhane, is in the heart. And so our right hand would go onto our heart, and this is how we would honor our internal masculine. Our internal feminine is the unihipili, the unihipili, and that would go to our sacral. And we call that in the Hawaiian culture, the na'au. And the na'au would be like our place of intuition. It's like the, the home of the oracle. Um, it's a place of, of meditation. And that's why the feminine is uh, constantly correlates to quantum energy. It's coming into that oracle energy the meditative state. Masculine comes into the heart, a place of great activity. The masculine is truly that to which designs the actual infrastructure of our lives. And so when we uh, hold this position and we invite the marriage of the feminine and the masculine, what we're also doing is we're allowing that feminine energy, that to which is channeling, right? The oracle channeling and offering that to the masculine as instructions. The masculine receives that and then builds an infrastructure of what it is receiving from the feminine, from the foundation of the feminine. So before we even go into a proper position, I would like to share with you what my protocol is with this. The first thing that I do in Kulike is I choose to land. Now, Martha, when I feel into landing, I am removing myself of fixations of a past and cravings for a future. 
I deem this current moment sufficient. For me, there is nothing more interesting than this current moment. At my huelo, my tailbone, I feel this very generous tug. This tug, also known as sacred gravity, is connecting me to the iron crystal core of this planet. I remember that my relationship with this planet and with gravity is not a punishment, nor is it an imprisonment. I remember that this has been designed in mutual consent, and I am one of its engineers. I choose to land. Mm. Only in this landing can we make contact with these energy centers. I'll ask that we lift our right hand. In lifting our right hand, we are in recognition of our internal masculine, the uhane. Let's restore the masculine to its rightful throne, that of the puuvai or the heart space. Let's place that right hand over our heart. Let's you and I take a deep breath in through the nose and hold. Holding this breath, applying this oxygen in the puuvai. Let's fill that chamber with oxygen. Let's be generous with our internal masculine. And exhale through the mouth. In this exhalation, feeling the relaxation of the internal masculine. Removed of competition, comparisons, urgency, and belligerency. Restored as the hero. Here in the Pu'uvai, I offer a mantra of our hero. Pa vale Pu'uvai. I open my heart wider. Mahalo, Uhane, I love you. Keeping our right hand over our pu'uvai, let's now make contact with our internal feminine, the unihipili. Let's lift our left hand. Let's restore the unihipili to its rightful throne, that of the na'au or the sacral. Let's place that left hand over our sacral. Let's you and I take a deep breath in through the nose and hold. Holding this breath, applying this oxygen in the na'au. Let's fill that chamber with oxygen. Let's be generous with our internal feminine. Sip one more breath. And exhale through the mouth. In this exhalation, feeling the proliferation of the internal feminine, removed of condemnation, censorship, neglect, restored as the leader. Here in the Na'au, I offer a mantra of our leader. Ua malu. I am safe. I decide. Mahalo. Unihipili, and I love you. And now that our hands are in the proper position known as kulike, a moment to integrate this right relation between the noun and the verb, the intention and the manifestation, the dream and the action. We honor this kulike by uttering three times. Alohama, Alohama, Alohama. Mahalo. Aloha ma means self-reflective love. It is truly the cosmic objective, <laughs> I feel, <laughs> of our experience in this phenomenal world. Self-reflective love. Hmm.
Thank you so much. You know, Martha, uh, when I when I perform kulike with people, because I have my eyes closed as well, right? Mm -hmm. When I perform kulike with someone and I open my eyes, I'm like, I remember you, Martha. Yeah, yes. I remember you. <laughs> 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 mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, true connection comes from that. Mm -hmm. I can feel it. I can feel it. My own being connecting with my own self. And then, yeah. <laughs> mm. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, and I would just love to name out loud for everybody listening that I was saying before we started recording you know a lot of these youtube videos and interviews i mean they're beautiful and wonderful and i love them um and a lot of them can be very much in the mind and and so i was saying i think my sense is that this conversation i think wants to be more here as opposed to here um here yeah <laughs> exactly so that's i'm now dropped way here and and I would just invite everybody listening if that feels right to just really engage, you know. I think there's so much wanting to come alive in ourselves in this conversation, but just in in the world that is so and has so many layers beyond what our mind typically does. And I think that maybe is related to even what we're about to talk about is my guess. <laughs> no. Um and to that I want to say, Martha when we're caught in the head, when I have been caught in the head, if my masculine, my internal masculine, right, the verb of me mm -hmm. is caught in the head, it still has a great potential of engineering. Mm -hmm. But what it doesn't have and what it does have when it's in the heart is artistry. That's when the masculine becomes an artist. Oh. Is when it goes back to the heart. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> so beautiful. Yeah. I think we could have a whole conversation just about <laughs> that. <laughs> wow. Um, well, so from that place, it's like, suddenly I'm just very slow, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is awesome. But um, yeah, I would love to maybe start with, so when we got, when we got on the call, you, I was, we were dropping in and I was saying, well, what's the most alive for you, you know, for this conversation? And you very immediately had an answer, which was the Lelia Kuhanua, the Sedna, the Oort cloud beings, the Kuiper belt beings, Haumea, et cetera. So do you want to just start with, yeah, what is that? That's a lot. Why, why is that alive for you? And do you want to name what, and yeah. just go with what's, yeah, what's present for you? Sure, thank you. And, you know, for the audience, this is actually Lele Aku Honua, uh, which is this being in the Oort class is what united Martha and I. Martha reached out to me uh, because uh, of uh, my ability to translate Hawaiian words and just asked me, you know, for, for an angle of what that could represent. And so it's really that to which united us. And so I would really love to honor the conversation about Lele Aku Honua. And when I went into the uh, memory of Lele Aku Honua, uh, several other uh, beings um, also appeared and wanted to be discussed uh, in relation to that. And I feel like these Kuiper Bell or cloud beings, it has a lot to do with like the frontier or the frontier to which humanity is at right now. And so especially if we correlate that to Aquarian energy and many know Aquarian energy to be very futuristic. And so these uh, these beings likely have uh, pieces of support for us as far as uh, what we are evolving as um, and, and a choice point for all of us. I have five, five of these beings that are both in the Kuiper and the Oort that uh, showed up and asked to be translated. As, oh. yeah yeah oh, cool yeah translate mm -hmm. as far as their names and mm -hmm. i need to preface uh uh by sharing with the audience so in my culture in mu hawaiian and this is even well preserved in modern hawaiian but uh our what we call kiakahi or our purpose is coded in our names 
And so, you know, when these planets are initially what we perceive maybe to be assigned names, there's no mistake in that, right? It had to find itself to that being somehow. So there's a sophistication in this. And initially, the reason for assigning or having a kiakahi, a purpose in a name, is one way to which uh, we ensured that we do not succumb altogether to amnesia. And so when we come into this world of form, the transition can be so uh, traumatic, perhaps, um, that many of us, our memories are wiped clean. And then we spend our entire existence in this plane just attempting to retrieve what we feel we have lost. But for us uh, Native Hawaiians and Mu Hawaiians, if we experience amnesia, we just refer to our name. And our name tells mm -hmm. us what our kiakahi, our purpose is. And so mm -hmm. the names of these dwarf planets likely share what their purpose is or what their energetic quality or essence is. Absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if, if I may. Yeah. I have five. Yeah. Specifically that were just like, they volunteered. <laughs> Go for it. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so which is in the ort, right? The other ort being that we have is Sedna. Sedna also volunteered. And then we have Haumea, which that's in the Kuiper, right, Martha? That's Kuiper, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we have Eris, which is also in the Kuiper. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. And then Make Make, which is also in the Kuiper. Mm -hmm. So those are the five that volunteered and said, just open up the conversation. And before I go into deciphering these names and the energetics, I just want to clarify that I am a authority. I'm not the authority. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sharing what my memory is. And I'm also sharing like how it can be transferred in a way. Okay. And so just have fun with this. As I share, just have fun and see if it correlates to your memory. See if it correlates to even the mythology behind um, many of these dwarf planets. Mm -hmm. I would love to begin with actually Eris, mm -hmm. this dwarf planet Eris. So first, I want to just take that word Eris and then do a play on words with that. If I uh, replace the I with an E, uh, it is a Spanish word, and it means to be, to be. Oh, it is. Mm. It is, to be. That stuck out to me because if I take that word eres and then I translate it in a Mu Hawaiian word by just playing with the symbols a little bit, and this is common in my culture, we do do this mm. with many other languages. We just play with symbols and then we bring it into familiarity uh, with our own language. So if I take Eris and I translate it in a Mu Hawaiian word, it changes. Well, actually, Heather Heather Ensworth, who is a good friend of yours and mine's, is going to love this because Heather loves to um, refer to Eris as Zena. Yeah. <laughs> the original name of uh -huh. is Zena. And so let's actually focus on Zena. Oh, so oh. <laughs> here's for you, Heather. <laughs> let's take Zena. And let's translate Zena into a Mu Hawaiian word. And so we wouldn't have an X, but we would uh, have a W instead. And then the W is actually pronounced as a V. So it would be Vina, Vina. Mm -hmm. Now remember, Eris, translated in Spanish, uh, is to be, mm -hmm. to be, or you are, you are. And then we have Vina, which translates literally as blood relation. Now, when I feel into blood relation, you are, it's talking about identity. Identity. And so when I fell into that, into this dwarf planet of Erosina and, and what it potentially holds as a code or as a quality, as an essence, for me, it represents a place of identity. Mm. This is a place to which we can hold counsel with to affirm identity. And then maybe for the audience, if you feel comfortable, uh, Martha, what is your uh, knowledge of Erosina? And can that, do you find a trend, a uh, correlation between those two? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my my approach to Aristina is, I think, almost exactly the same as Heather's. Um, and and I've done a free talk on on it. And yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I I think of Aristina among other things as being associated with doing things in your own way, right? And and really um, um, standing up for justice, standing up for truth, being a a, um, a sacred warrior and a sacred warrior-esse. Erisina is very prominent in my own chart and is sitting right on my south node for the last, what, two or three years. It's right there. <laughs> and so, so it's very, very strong energy for me right now. Um, but that totally fit. Absolutely. Beingness, like you, Aristina helps me ground in who am I? And if, if I need to go my own way and do it and do things in my, and my work absolutely has been showing up. I'm doing astrology, but not exactly on the normal path of, you know, what think people would expect or my own spiritual work too. Um, uh, that I have to stay really true to me and my own. Yeah. Does that fit with what you're feeling? Most certainly. If if it holds this code of identity, you know, of, of affirming uh, what a true identity is, not based on the influence of the external conditions or or the, the condition patterning, but coming into one's true sovereign identity. And for mm -hmm. me, the, the goddess Zena really represents that. You know, Zena is like this, this character who cannot be formable in, in any other kind of category. It's so sovereign. It's such a sovereign energy, which has also yeah. led to a lot of the strife in this character's life, because there's a difficulty in other people relating to it mm -hmm. because it's so sovereign. And so now we have this, this dwarf planet that feels like it's uh, an activation point of coming into true identity. And so as I engage and have a relationship with this planet, I'm aware that this is likely a place to which I can hold counsel to become activated in my identity. Oh. Yes. And so that's Eris. Now, let's move on to Haumea. Mm -hmm. So Haumea, of course, is a Hawaiian group. And it's a Hawaiian goddess. Um, but within that word, if if... Uh, I could, of course, talk about the goddess Haumea, but I really want to uh, focus on the actual symbol of mm -hmm. Haumea, the word Haumea, because coded in that word is a quality. So how, uh, first, mea uh, means being, like being, a being, right? You and I are beings. Mea means being. How means like I see, I see. I see being. And of course, logistically, we can feel like, well, that makes sense because it's, you know, the outer reaches. So it's likely very icy. So yes, logistically. So now I'm going to go into the poetic translation of what that really means. Mm -hmm. Something icy being. Immediately, Martha, I was taken to the seed bank in Norway where things are preserved. And then we feel into how Haumea is this goddess of fertility. Okay, this is where uh, fertility and conception. Mm. And now I'm feeling into, wow, Haumea, this planet, the energetics of this planet, it's a library. It's a library. So this energy of Haumea is this place of, it's a library. It's a place of incredible organization. It's how things are organized. And, you know, even with Haumea, <clears throat> the goddess, she represents lineages. And lineages is how one of the ways to which we uh, modern Hawaiians uh, have a relationship with protocol or how things are organized. And so now we have this dwarf planet that holds the codes, is the centerpiece of the library of our solar system and organization. And then... Yeah. Uh, is there anything you want to share about your understandings and memory about Haumea? I have honestly been pretty hesitant to um, interpret her. <laughs> um, Haumea and Makemake in particular, I've been really standing back and 
So, but this is landing really deeply in me. And um, yeah, I'm thinking about as I would love to bring up, I'm going to look at the chart, but I mean, you know, how Maya is, uh, I think trining Pluto, right? I, I'm going to triple check that, but I'm just feeling, I'm just feeling into it in this, my inner knowings are very in the moment right now as you're talking. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I want to just clarify with the audience so that icy being, and when that ice part took me to uh, Norway to the seed bank, it's preservation, right? The ice is what's preserving. Oh, like the library. It's a library. It's a place where all things are organized and then categorized properly. Mm -hmm. and so I would have a relationship. I would hold counsel with Haumea uh, if I need to acquire information or if I need to become organized. Wow. Now, if I, let's move on to Makemake. You just brought up Makemake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Makemake so makemake is, is a word that's very commonly uh, resourced in modern Hawaiian. Um, this makemake is specifically correlates to another Polynesian culture, though, uh, in Rapa Nui. Um, so I'll speak on behalf of its translation in the Hawaiian language, which uh, I feel beautifully is succinct with our cousins in Rapa Nui. But uh, so the word makemake literally means to long for, mm -hmm. to reach for, to desire. Many feel that Maki Maki is this fertility counterpart to Haumea, okay? So it could have this masculine fertility counterpart. What's important about translating Maki Maki by its word, its symbol, right? Which literally means to long for, to reach. It's actually talking about ambition, ambition. And then if we feel into fertility and we uh, allow ourselves to engage with fertility uh, with a very masculine quality, that verb quality, it's all about ambition. And so I would feel that uh, Maki Maki uh, is like this code of the future. The future. I want to take us back to Eris really quickly. Eris would be the present because it's identity, right? Because mm. I was feeling like there's a template happening here with the ones that I'm sharing. Okay? Whoa. Eris is, is present. Mm. Haumea is really like consolidation, okay, organization, library. And then we have Maki Maki, which is future. The codes of the future because it's about ambition. It's a place of great ambition. And I, I know that you just shared that Maki Maki is one that you are, you know, considering. Uh, but is there anything that you would like to share about Maki Maki? Um, well, no, it, again, it's just Hamea and Maki Maki in particular. I felt the need to step back because I really want to deeply listen to them and deeply listen to people who are maybe of the cultures that their names come out of. <laughs> so again, I haven't really, really gone there, but I do. Can I bring up the chart really quick? Cause sure. I can just show you and show people. Um, so to correct my, myself, Haumea is not, Haumea is squaring Pluto. Exactly. So, uh, and then Make Make is on the South node. So they're both really highlighted, um, astrologically. Here's Pluto at zero of Aquarius. Here is Haumea at zero of Scorpio. So they're exactly, I mean, almost to the minute, they're almost to the minute squaring each other. <laughs> and they're going to be in this long-term square because they both move slowly and they're both part of the Kuiper belt. Right. And then here's Maki Maki on the South node. Um, and I just wanted to say something about how Maya and the iciness and then with Pluto, with its square to Pluto, because Pluto, something so cool about Pluto, maybe you already know this is, um, it, it also has ice and that melt in its orbit, it thaws and then freezes and then thaws and then freezes, right? So there's something about the, pre you're saying the preservation through ice with Haumea um, and the relationship, the dance it's doing with Pluto right now, I, I mm -hmm. can feel there's more there. Does any, yeah. I don't, does anything arise for you? Well, the word for Pluto in Mu dialect, which is actually the same in Sumerian, uh, that's so fun. So a lot of the planets in Mu 
uh, it's the exact same as Sumerian. Mm. Uh, and the word for Pluto is Gaga, G-A-G-A, Gaga. Mm. And if I'm to translate that, it means to weave, to weave. And especially when you're sharing, right, thawing, freezing, thawing, freezing, there's some sort of weaving that's wow. in the extremes, the extremes of thawing, the extremes of freezing. There's some sort of weaving that's happening. Like the first thing that comes to me when I feel into how you presented it, thawing and then freezing, it's like a homeostasis. The weaving in order to affirm this homeostasis. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah, I feel many more layers in all of that. But okay, keep going, keep going. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, so so just to uh, do a recap, Eris, mm -hmm. uh, identity. So it's the present. Mm -hmm. Haumea, uh, icy being, place to which things are categorized, preserved. It's a library. It's a place of organization. It's like if if there's a square because especially because we're working with five right so there's like if we have a square um Haumea would be right in the middle or what they would call like the centroid the geometric center and wow. so you can feel that Haumea is to which everything must pass through or everything must hold counsel with as they engage with one another Haumea is right there, the centroid mm -hmm. and then Makimaki Maki is the future to long for, to desire. Makimaki Maki is the male fertility god, right? In Rapa Nui, which makes sense to me because it's verb-based so that that replication, that makes total sense. The fertility has now this ambition. And so it would represent the future. It's a place of future energetics. And then Lele Aku Honua, which is our friend, Martha, <laughs> that brought you and I together. And this is one of the most recent, right, Martha? Yeah, most very, very, very. Nobody nobody has talked about it until basically now, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, wonderful that, you know, we can give sort of uh, an idea of its energetics just based on its name. Mm -hmm. So, Lele Honua. So, if you see the word printed, you'll notice that there's two accent bars, what we call a kahako, and they would be on the first A and then on the U. So an accent bar will totally change the meaning of a word completely. So first, I wanted to share, if there was no accent bar, uh, this is what it would mean, and it still makes a lot of sense, and that would be uh, to move away from the planets. Lele aku honua, to move away from the planets. So that even makes sense logistically. Now, if we uh, pronounce it properly with the accent bars, lele aku honua, now it means the watery being birth of planets. Birthed of, O-F? Yes. Of? of, so as like a consequence. Whoa. Of planets. Now, this would represent the past. Remember, we have future, present, and now Lele Akuhonua is the past, birth of planets. And um, what what do you, you just had a moment there, my sister. What, <laughs> what, would, you, what would you like to share? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, um, I think you heard what I described in the conversation I recently had with Pam Gregory about Lele Akuhonua. <laughs> but what I the image that has kept coming to me over the past two, three months is this sense of, uh, I want to call her a her. <laughs> anyway, I'm trying not to use the word her. Anyway, I'll let myself use the word her with the caveat that I get it, that it's gender neutral probably. But um, yeah, I keep seeing her orbit. It's a 36,000 year orbit, right? It's like the longest orbit that I think we maybe know of of any being um in our solar system i could have that wrong but it's three times longer than the orbit of sedna and um so i when i when i tune into her she she i feel her whole orbit at the same happening at the same time so like no time no past no future all at the same time and then it feels like like i, I get this image of like a hula hoop and then i get the feeling of this I guess you could call it Lemuria or I don't know. I get a, a sense of like a city 
rising up from the ocean, the depths of the ocean. So it reminds me of what you're saying of coming, birthing, what did you just say? Coming from the planets? What was the? the... Being of the watery being birthed of planets. That, okay, <laughs> right. So if our solar system is like an ocean in a sense, right? And there's a, it's a, the consciousness of, that is a watery being birthed of the solar system of the planets that that's that's it's hard to put it into human words but that's like it fits with that feeling that i get um yeah martha because i'm even feeling now that you're clarifying about this colossal orbit it has it it, it truly right documents everything that is occurring within our solar system yeah and in this watery being of course many of us are coming to know that water is that the the archive it's plasma it's the archive so the watery being so information birth of planets it's a historical reference it's it's the consequence of the history of our solar system is and so it represents the past. We have Eris present. We have Maki Maki future. Leleakuhonua past, and then we have Haumea, which is the centroid. Mm. And then let me just bring up uh, Sedna. Yeah. So we can complete, you know, the four points, right? And yeah, then yeah. Haumea, which is the centroid. But now we have Sedna, and of course. Uh, for the audience, especially those who are, you know, very versed, right, in like the cosmos, uh, especially Kuiper Belt, and we're not talking about all of them. These are just the five that had volunteered, okay? So now Sedna, once again with Sedna, I get to take that word and I get to uh, orient it so that it's compatible to the Mu language. And so I would replace the S and the D. Now, when I do that in the proper protocol, I come up with two words and I want to translate both of them because they're both pretty significant and they actually correlate to what Sedna is. And perhaps, Martha, you could share with the audience the energies of Sedna, that word Sedna and the goddess Sedna. But one is Lena. So Lena, Lena, and Lena means to leap into, to leap into. Remember the story of Sedna? to leap into, okay? Now, the second, lehena, if I'm to translate that in English, it means nakedness. Now, here's why that's important for me in correlation to the story of Sedna. It's about becoming orphaned. It's about becoming stripped of everything you once knew to which now you have to take a leap into the unknown, mm. into this. And so this energy of Sedna, I feel, is a centerpiece. It is a hub. It is a place of initiations. This is the dwarf planet of initiations. When I have a relationship with Sedna, as I hold counsel with Sedna, I am aware that this is a place of incredible initiations. And for all of us, we know that's not always going to be pleasant because look at the story of Sedna. Uh, sister, can you just share a little bit about Sedna? Yeah, I mean, so my brief version, would be, please add in, um, is that she is a, she's a goddess who was essentially uh, initiated by being taken by the shaman or the a being who came and took her from her home uh, with her father Kate quote unquote kidnapped her or she went willingly or whatever virgin you want and then her father came to retrieve her and she's then in a boat with her father and the the shaman who originally had taken her um, comes to get her from her father and creates this huge storm and the father then becomes scared that he will die <laughs> so, so um, he tries to throw Sedna overboard um, so he can save himself. And Sedna tries to grab onto the side of the boat of her father. And the father still is determined to save his own life. So he hits her fingers with the oar. And then her fingers break off, fall into the ocean. She eventually falls into the ocean herself. 
her fingers turn into sea creatures and her she dies but then be, is reborn as the goddess of the sea or whatever again there's so many versions to that um how does that you you add in or change or did i you forget know, something okay <laughs> yes and that's why i feel you know those pieces too of that story of sedna is that she's in an initiation where one part of the initiation is to become in a way orphaned right and and this is why i feel she also has a very very special unique relationship with eris identity because Sedna, as this hub, this energetic hub of initiations, I feel it's also a place of reorienting into one's truth. That's the abyss. That's the nakedness that the translation Lahaina talks about. Nakedness is to be stripped. Her fingers were cut off. She was stripped of all these false identities. She was stripped of a relationship with her father or her genetic code. She was orphaned in a way to which she had to go into the depths in order to orient herself into her truth. And so for me, Sedna, this dwarf planet, holds the code, is the energetics of initiations. Well, and then can I real quick bring up the chart again? Yes. This is super, super important. <laughs> Talking about this. Again, Pluto. Let's come back. Pluto's Pluto's a player here because <laughs> not only is Pluto squaring Haumea in this long-term square, but Pluto is also trining Sedna in a long-term trine. Right? So it's like, huh, what? What's uh, <laughs> like we can't forget Pluto is what I'm I'm coming back. There's something here. Um that Pluto. Yeah. Pluto with the gaga, meaning to weave, I feel like it's even this place where you and I, who are closer to Apsula or to our sun, where we can uh, more intimately relate to these dwarf planets. I feel like it could even be an intermediary, uh, Pluto, so that we can relate uh, more intimately with these otherwise just the energetics of these dwarf planets can be just so beyond um or sphere of of our established consciousness yeah now pulling us into this greater sphere of consciousness yeah. which for me it's so aquarian <laughs> it, yes it's for me it's so epic and it's like absolutely yeah <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. so beautiful mm. and and so just a, a recap with uh, with the audience, we have these five beings that presented themselves and Pluto's there, right? Keeping it all together. But then mm -hmm. we have five beings. And just a recap, we have Eris. We have four points of this, this uh, square, okay? One point is Eris and it represents that which is present, presence, identity. We have another side of the square that is maki maki, and that represents future. Mm -hmm. It's ambition. We have another uh, angle of the square, and that is lele uh, aku honua, which is past. It represents the past. We have another angle of the square that is setna. It is the place of initiations. And then we have the centroid, which is... Um, Haumea, and that represents the library. It is mm -hmm. the place of organization. Mm -hmm. So there's a template there, Martha, and I really feel this. You know, there's a template, and it's even a geometry. There's 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 something within the oscillation, within this relationship, that may be unfathomable to us right now and that's why it's always really fun and also responsible for us to engage and and to establish a proper relationship with them individually yeah um, so that when they combine their powers right then we are fluent and we uh have are the energetic match in order to know that language as well so mm -hmm. individually first and foremost and then begin to feel that vortex of all of them um, coming into that united power, which who knows what that is. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I have a question <laughs> that is maybe pushing a little bit of an edge, but feels alive. So I'll ask it. 
So this is something I've sat with a lot and I've talked about in videos and I think I emailed with you a little bit about this, but so on a bigger, like on a, on a big level of, um, in astrology or just in our world, when we're engaging with these beings, they're, they're very newly quote unquote discovered by astronomers and, and very new to the astrology world. Right. So it feels like we're in a moment right now at the beginning of engaging with these beings. And it feels, I feel very strongly that it's important for us to like, take a deep breath, slow way down and be extremely conscious about how we choose to engage or not engage or how, how to proceed. <laughs> right. And, and you, I think, you know, my opinion already on this, but I would love to hear your thought. I mean, basically I think we've had a way of, of engaging with data or information or new discoveries that is extremely colonialist to be very blunt and just put it, you know, in words. And I, I am trying in my own way, very hard not to do that. <laughs> so, um, I don't know from your perspective, do you have anything you would want to say about any of that or yeah, what feels an integrity or doesn't feel an integrity for you? Or you clearly just demonstrated something that you're, you know, what does feel an integrity is beautiful. So you've just shown us, but is there anything you want to say about it? Yeah. You know, one other thing uh, along these lines, one other thing I feel into Aquarian energy. So in tropical, I'm sun Aquarius, right? So I, I feel like I kind of have authority speak on mm. Aquarian energy. <laughs> mm, 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 mm. But one great thing about Aquarian energy is that it's available for everything and everyone to share in leadership. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what's one great thing about uh, things coming into the collective consciousness that have not been clearly defined and established in a fixed identity is we all get to make contributions. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, right, when we all create uh, these contributions, we're all going to pick up on a theme that's likely what's most honest. Mm -hmm. And so allowing everyone to engage, have a relationship with these beings, and then allowing other people to make a contribution of their own translation. I was just one example, me sharing my translation of my relationship. When I have conversations with these beings, there's one essential thing, and that is I must consent myself to become available to be a conduit of these yeah. beings. Mm. You gotta open up, you gotta open your heart. You know, uh, many of us, are, our hearts are shut, you know, the whole psyche, everything's shut. And so a lot of the information that we may be sharing is just regurgitated information that we are observing. It's not allowed to be filtered through ourself. The filtering of the self, it's going to create a very unique quality. That's what we want from one another. That's what we want to celebrate from one another is that unique quality. Then as we all make that contribution, we're going to see the themes that show up. That is likely what is most honest. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. And as you know, for anyone, but for anyone listening who doesn't know this, I held a free event and it's actually a free kind of mini course about Lelia Kuhanua that is meant to be, and it's still available. Anybody, I'll put the link here and anybody can sign up for it for totally for free. <laughs> it's all this, it's this, right. That, that I, I felt like, um, specifically with that being, but I feel like with all of these beings, um, I didn't want to try to be an expert at all. I want to hold space for the, this more Aquarian co-remembering, um, and these conversations where like you're coming as an expert, not the expert, but we all are in our own ways, quote unquote, ex we're all beings of the solar system. We're all beings being held by the Oort cloud, literally, right? We all are made of stardust. That's it's just a fact. Um, yeah. And yeah, um, right. So that's the purpose of that free course. And again, anybody and everybody, please sign up and engage with it however you want. Um, yeah, but so yes, I 1000% agree with that, that we're each needed. Our wisdom is each, yeah, mm -hmm. one piece. Yes. <clears throat> 
Yeah. And that, that piece too, Martha, about being available, it's so important because uh, the uh, internal feminine, so in the Mu culture and, and in my own memory, there are two basic fundamental primary laws of like life consciousness. One is feminine, one is masculine. The masculine law is do no harm. Hmm. Do no harm. That's even in the Hippocratic Oath, I believe. So it's something yeah. that has kind of like maintained a history, even in modern culture. It's something that's been honored, right? But the feminine law, the feminine law is consent. Beautiful. It's consent. And that seems to be something that is not a topic of conversation to the point where it could be so that we truly come into what is the artistry of consent? What does that truly mean? And so like when I was sharing about my relationship with Eris, Haumea, Make Make, Sedna, Lele Aku Honua, I am consenting to be available for them to resource me as a conduit. That's all it took for this information to just become friendly enough for me to not be afraid to share this with yeah. others. And so perhaps that can be a place for, or people begin, where do you honor consent and where is consent absent in your life? And this doesn't only mean where are you affirming your own consent, but where are you not honoring the consent of others? Right. Once we reorient that, I feel like that's a major thread in this feminine shift. I would say it is the thread in the feminine shift is to orient ourselves back into consent. War cannot stand up to that. Mm. Hatred cannot stand up to that. Mm. Yes. I feel that right down here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, and so I have two more questions. So I'm I'm gonna guess this is a yes, but uh when you are engaging with them, do you also ask their consent to engage with you in addition to giving your consent? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Once you <laughs> affirm the language of consent within yourself, mm -hmm. it will be a language that you can detect in the exterior conditions as well. Mm -hmm. And so you know how to engage with mutual consent. I feel like that's the pathway to true intimacy. That's when all the corridors, everything opens up. The world becomes generous again. You know, feminine is quantum energy. And one thing that we do know about quantum energy, sure, it can be perceived as volatile because it's the potential is so vast. Mm -hmm. But within that volatility, it's generous. Mm -hmm. It's generous. <laughs> Beautiful. And I experience it as infinite. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last question coming up for me is, so I know that, I know that part of your answer to this probably is, I don't know. And that's like a beautiful answer. Uh, but when you, when you sit with that, the five points that you've just been describing, um, how may in the middle and the four around that her, um, uh, if you just are with that, the beingness of that, the five together, what arises for you? Like what is there? Okay. So I, I've felt into this, right, Martha. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just sharing my musings with everyone, but yeah. I feel that convergence, that, that technology, uh, we can even feel it right as a biopsychic technology, a biomythic technology. I feel it holds the very code to our quantum leap. <laughs> Other than that, I mean, um, <laughs> that that's not a big deal at all. No. <laughs> yeah, just that, you know. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, can you say some more, please? <laughs> wow. You know, I feel like we're, <laughs> we're in this kind of trajectory right now. Um, the oscillation is so rapid that I feel like it's it, it can be so distracting. And when we have like this, this beautiful technology 
uh, that is presenting itself, it can really support us in reorienting uh, back into a kind of coherence as far as to what is the trajectory for humanity. And one thing that I just wanted to share with everyone that I've come into clarity about is that we have this destiny called love. Mm -hmm. And uh, love is likely our legacy. You know, there's universes and every universe in, in the Mu doctrines in my own memory, every universe has a legacy. Love, from what I remember, is our legacy, which means it's also a destiny. That's why we live in a world, a consciousness of works, of works. We are designing love. And it is love in its proper design that we will transfer into the next universe. That will be the perpetuation of a legacy. And oh. just, just to share the sophistication of this, and I'm going to resource the new doctrines, the previous universe is something that in, the, in my uh, lineage we call Madana. Madana. And Madana is something that's unfathomable to us now. But we have like a breadcrumb, and that's the octopus. Because in the doctrines, the octopus is the only like survivor from that universe that was allowed to come into this universe for the purpose of transferring that universe's legacy. So this universe exists because the octopus transferred that universe's legacy. And that universe's legacy is based on, this is all coded now, it's based on the body and the behavior of the octopus. So if we were to do like a run through and to do like a, an intellectual dissemination and a spiritual dissemination of the octopus, the, the body and the behavior, we actually arrive at electricity. And so likely the legacy of the previous universe was electricity. They transferred that into this universe. So our base theme in this universe is electricity. And that's very true. You and I cannot exist without electricity. That's what's holding this entire universe together is how plasma is behaving with electricity. But that's our base theme. We have a destiny and our destiny is love. So from this base theme of electricity, we are to ensure that we design properly into a point of completion, love. Once that is accomplished, we will transfer love into the next universe and their base theme will be love and they will design a destiny of love. Wow. Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I have so many thoughts and feelings running through me right this second. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just give this a little like, I'll do the little quick version of what's going on for me. So, so, okay. We're recording this on Tuesday, August 20th, 2024. Last night was a full moon, incredibly powerful full moon mm -hmm. in Aquarius, which was squared exactly to the degree by Uranus, right? With Uranus ruling Aquarius, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. It was also the first of three Jupiter Saturn squares. It was like the unbelievably powerful, you're, you know, Uranian Aquarian full moon, <laughs> um, probably somewhere opposite your, I mean, probably somewhere with your sun or something. I don't know where your sun is exactly, but anyway, in there, that whole deal. Okay. So, so when I looked at the chart of the full moon, I was thinking on the, on a certain 3d level, I was like, Oh, Oh, this could be, you know, volatile, like things could happen that are in the 3d world. Not so pleasant, blah, blah, blah. But what actually ended up coming alive for me in this past weekend, yesterday, and then now in this conversation, this whole, I mean, Uranus and Aquarius have so much to do with electricity, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the whole, the way I see it, the way I'm shown by the spirit world is the, the entire um, light grid of existence. So I'm shown we could have many more hours conversation about this. I'll just, again, try to keep this really succinct in my own praying. I get every day, I get taken out of the time space continuum and I'm shown the whole time space continuum as like a cocoon or a womb or 
something like that. And then the whole time space continuum, it has a, an infinite light grid, which to me is where that electricity runs. Right. And, and a certain version of love runs. So, so anyway, so you're sparking for me just on the energetics of this, this moment that we happen to be recording in feels like it's actually on this really amazing level that I wasn't even expecting until now here we are. <laughs> it's like what's coming alive for me actually is uh, both in this conversation and stuff I experienced in the last couple of days. It's like the, the light grid of existence, that electricity feels like it's just lighting up, like, boom, like here we are, you know? And, um, and there's an element in there for me also of pure, the pure essence of what love is, because I think it's part of, part of the electricity that runs through that light grid is this very pure essence of actual divine love. Like the electricity and love aren't the same, but there's, do you get what I'm trying to say? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's like oh. this charge, right? Mm, mm, I mm. feel like this charge is what inspires us to even exist. Mm. Motivates us to even endure. Mm. This. And then we bring in, right, this, this technology, this biopsychic, biomythic technology that's happening in the outer reaches of our solar system mm -hmm. that may be this code of a quantum leap so that we come into the frequency of cosmic love as well. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh my god well okay and then i'll give the also 10 second version of something that could be like a whole day conversation <laughs> but i was telling you also before we started recording that that i've been asked six years ago to channel a series of eight books all right and six years ago i channeled the first one five years ago i channeled the second and the third um but the the middle three are what i've been sitting with for the last four years and they're called love speaks the goddesses speak and the gods speak so they're about the infinite petals of the divine feminine the infinite petals of the divine masculine and then this imperative that we absolutely have to have to have to have to have to um come into the healing of our own inner feminine own inner masculine and then the healing between the two the inner sacred union in ourselves right but the love speaks part just in my own journey personally, which I won't go into, but it just in the last few weeks has been massively, powerfully coming alive in a whole different way for me. And, and what the spirit world is, I think, trying to show me is this other way of loving, this other version of love that is so massively powerful and it transcends anything I, at least I have experienced in this lifetime. And I've experienced a heck of a lot of love, like very, lots of versions of love, but this version of love, it's like the ultimate feminine, the ultimate masculine, just going kaboom. <laughs> like it's time now for the two to come back together. We have to come back together. We are not separate. We don't have a feminine over there and a masculine. Over there. We have to come back together. And it's the power of that, that in, intense intense love that's going to make it happen right um and then that helps anyway then my brain kind of fries because that's right where i am with my <laughs> learning <laughs> but there's something so imperative about not about really diving into what is what is love actually like we have this concept we are love etc cetera, etc cetera, but what does that actually mean and again I, this is you know a huge journey in and of itself, a huge conversation in and of itself. But there's some something I think calling me personally, and I think calling us to really open that that concept of what love actually truly is on this epic level um, that is needed, 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 needed right now. Yes. To, yeah. Go. Anything you want to say to that? <laughs> Yeah. I would, say, I would say one of the things that can be reconciled, perhaps, for us to, you're speaking into, like, it is it is quite a mystery to us. Perhaps it must always remain a mystery, but we get to come into a kind of fluency so we know how to transfer it. Remember, that's the objective. 
we get to transfer it into another universe. So although it remains mysterious forever and ever, it cannot be measured, it cannot be locatable, it cannot be all the things to which we will control it, but we get to come into a kind of fluency so that we engage with it, we embody it, so it becomes transferable. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I will just share with the audience of one of the greatest disruptions of our ability to come into fluency of love is when we go back to Mu, Lemuria, the fall, the fall, the code of the great disruption is in the fall. I've shared this so many times before, but there was never a war in Mu, Lemuria. It's unfathomable. It's inconceivable for that energetic to engage in something known as war. War came much later as a consequence of this fall. The fall is attachment. Ah, oh, yes. Because and you got to feel it like this too. It's even it's even rational. If we become attached to something, we're not ascending. We're holding on. That's the fall. And so for us to truly engage in a proper fluency to transfer love, we must reconcile attachments. Uh, I, okay, I'm going to give you another 10 second version. Yes. <laughs> Yes. So yes, what I keep getting shown in my praying about this, this, you know, it's a very personal experience I'm having. So I won't go again, I won't go into details here. But, but essentially, I've been experiencing this version of love that is, it's way beyond anything I've ever known before, ever, ever, ever. And, and the number one thing the spirit world keeps telling me about this love and, and I, that I feel, I feel about this love is that with this person who I feel this love for, one of the reasons, one of the key reasons it is unlike anything I've ever experienced is because I absolutely, unconditionally love this person. Truly. I mean, really, truly. <laughs> and this person has a hard time even conceiving of it because I'm like, no, I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> really, really do. Um, but it's this power that just goes kaboom, <laughs> right? But it's above attachment. It literally is. And so the spirit world keeps saying to me, keep going, keep loving him, keep doing it, keep you have, this is, this is a way of you learning what that love is and love him completely and totally let him go at the same time. Yeah. Right. And it's like, we, I don't, we haven't been trained how to do this. Right. right. <laughs> and thank, thank goodness we have Sedna now because no, mm. no initiations mm, mm -hmm, as, as mm -hmm. if you're in this initiation of yes detaching yourself yes and, like, this is why it's one of those those angles of this square sedna so that we're being properly yes. initiated yes yes okay can can i do you have time for one more piece because that's sure. here okay okay so just in terms of the initiation again this is related to my own personal journey but i think people will, there's something that maybe wants to percolate more universally. So I heard the, the conversation you recently had with Heather Ensworth, which I loved, loved, loved. And at the end, you brought in the whales and the dolphins. And, um, and I, two weeks ago, was on a boat in the middle of um, a whole group of blue whales <laughs> with this person I'm talking about. <laughs> and and he and I felt like, not only with the whales, but just in this experience we're having, it was like an initiation, right? Um, but it felt like there was a really key, key component so far beyond my human brain comprehension of the whales presence. And of course, there were tons and tons and tons and tons of dolphins, just like super happy, like, you know, jumping and jumping and jumping next to the boat. Um so like hundreds, literally hundreds of dolphins. And then these humongous blue whales, the whole group of them, we're right in them. And two times, two of the whales came right toward our boat like this. And we were really, really close, really close. Um, so there was absolutely some incredible initiation. I got very seasick, <laughs> extremely nauseous the whole time. But, um, but I could feel it. And the, the, what, when I was so, so seasick, what I had to do was actually go, I had to close my eyes the whole time. I had to go down under the boat 
Mm-hmm. And what I kept feeling was this dolphin. I don't think there was, there maybe was, maybe wasn't an actual literal dolphin, but what I felt was a spirit at least of a dolphin grounding me and kept pulling me under, like down into the ocean, deep, 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 deep. And even after we got off the boat, I came home, went to sleep. And it was like the, still, I was getting pulled down into the ocean with the whales, with the dolphins. And I, there was no logical thing going on in my brain that could explain anything to me, but I just could feel it. I was literally being initiated, literally being initiated by the ocean, by my own soul, by some, I don't even, you know, I don't know what yet. Um, But yes, something, something very alive with those dolphins and those whales. And I'm just curious if there's anything you want to add in with any of that. What a, what a beautiful initiation, sister. Thank you for sharing that. The, if, if I were to, you know, make any kind of correlation, it would be the dolphin or the whales, you know, they sing their same song over and over again, their whole life. And yeah. so with whale energy, they'll remind you who you are. Mm-hmm. And, so, you know, if you're, uh, um, receiving that from the whales, it could cause you to have illness, sickness, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's disrupting surface identities that are asking you to detach. Yeah. And then we have the the dolphins and uh, the code of the dolphins is enjoyment. Mm-hmm. And so I love how they're uh, normally always working together because as we uh, are reminded of who we truly are, sometimes that can be uncomfortable. And then we bring in the dolphins, then the dolphins remind us, enjoy, enjoy. It's yeah. like what my kupuna, my elders would say every time I would be upset or I didn't get my way, they would be like, look, boy, boy, look, look listen, taste, smell, enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. And what that's bringing up for me again, is the message I've been getting, you know, and related to this not non-attachment version of love, right. The, the spirit world saying love him completely. And him is it's literal, but it's, it's a metaphor. Love, love completely and let go at the same time. Right. And so so to me, it feels like the whales pulling me down, 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 like ground so, so fully into who I am and be completely present with the love all the way in and then let go. And the letting go is free and fun and the whales super, super joyful and happy, right? It's not like, I think normally when we think of releasing attachment, there's grief or there's like, but I want that thing, (laughs) you know, and and the ultimate level, again, what I keep feeling with this version of love that is so powerful, so strong, yet so unconditional, that there is this freedom um, and purity in it. And and like, it's the, mm, I don't know, I just, just could cry for like days because it's so sublime. I don't even have words for it. Um, yeah, but something about the freedom and the 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 joy in the letting go too. Well, that that's even rational, Martha, because if we are to transfer love as a legacy into another universe, we also cannot perceive it to be a possession. Oh. Because if it's a possession, I don't want it. I, I want to keep it. I don't want to transfer it, right? And oh. so that's part of the initiation is that it's not a possession. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, wow. You just did it. You just did it for me. <laughs> wow. Right. Right. And then what are we here to do? I mean, literally, literally, as a being, what am I here to do? What are you like? I don't want to speak for you, but, you know, I would personally be so sad if I came to this lifetime, loved and hung on and didn't leave that legacy, right? Didn't release, right? I'm not here to do that. Right. No way. Absolutely not. <laughs> and that and Martha, that is a great example of you coming into the authority of your consent. Because many of us will come to realize, wait a minute, I'm engaging in that. I'm doing that. I've never consented to that. So mm-hmm. now is the moment I get to affirm that. We come into feminine power. I do not consent to that. I do not consent. No. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I do consent to loving and letting go. There you go. And, yes, that's the ship. That's a reorientation. Oh, wow. 
<laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> well, um, that was amazing. Yay. <laughs> thank you. Super thank fun. you. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you to these, these beings. Yeah. That, that took us on a little journey here. And to remind the audience, you know, begin your own conversation with these beings and, and please contribute. Yeah. Your, because when we all contribute, we're going to find the themes. And yeah. once again, the theme, the collective contribution, the themes we find therein is likely what is most honest. Yes. And what's needed. And yeah, yeah. absolutely beautiful. Wow, Keone. And I, I just want to name, I really, what, what I'm feeling in the way you're doing that is, you know, sacred leadership, big time, big time, big time. Oh, mahalo. mahalo. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Beautiful. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> okay. Um, so on a, a 3D level, um, would you like to, you have something coming up that you're going to be offering? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that. <laughs> so, um, one of the things that I uh, have received from my lineage, from this new lineage, is a twenty thousand year old breathing and movement practice known as Ulu. It's really an artistry of how to ensure that the spinal cord is limber. In my culture, we believe that the akasha is found in the spinal cord in the 33 vertebrae. So uh, Ulu uh, allows it to become more limber so that we can experience more disclosure. I'm gonna be uh, facilitating a virtual online membership of Ulu, everyone is welcome. It doesn't matter your level of expertise when it comes to your breathing or movement practices. Sometimes it's just a matter of just observing um, and it's free, completely free. And so everyone is welcome. It's ulu.pohala.net is the website where you can read a little bit more information, sign up for the wait list. I expect to open that portal uh, sometime in the fall. And then even if you're uh, listening to this and we're in the fall or in the winter, um, you can join any time because there's going to be replay access to everything to which we've engaged in. There's going to be an archive. And it will just be a great way for you to come into community, learn a little bit more about Mu culture, ancient Lemurian culture, and then also to what it could be like if you attend to your spinal cord. And then what will be released and disclosed to you when you mm. do to your spinal cord. So thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to share that, Martha. Yeah, I would I'm definitely going to be signing up for that. It sounds amazing. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. wow, wow, wow. Wow. Incredible. Beautiful. I feel so much coming a lot. Yeah, again, sacred leadership that you're holding. And I feel decades to come of such beauty emerging from you. It's like just an honor to be connected. Likewise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, and for people, again, sign up for the free Lele Akuhanua mini course thing that I have. And I have lots and lots of other free things on the same website and beautiful. I just love this growing community, you know, collective community and Heather's community and Pam's community, all of, all of us all together. It's just. Yeah. And on that, mm -hmm. I just want to like, thank you so much, Martha. Because mm -hmm. you are the pioneer to, to speak into this energetic. It's, it has a, it has a voice and you're extending that voice so that many of us become attuned to it as well. So I would never have connected with all of these uh, dwarf planets if it wasn't for you bringing Liliaku Honua to me so thank you so much for that uh -huh. so we're each doing our our piece <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> wonderful Keoni thank you so 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 much and everybody watching please please join in please join in your piece and we really would love to hear anything and everything you want to share thank you aloha mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.